Alright, so welcome to filmcastle.com and today I'm going to start a, um, a section on Cronenberg's films and I think we'll start with stereo uh, because that's at the beginning more or less. There was some stuff before that but I think stereo is a good place to start because it introduces all the themes that are going to be very, very important throughout the Cronenberg oeuvre. And uh, I should start by saying that uh, some of the things I'm going to say are referring to ideas in William Bird, uh, sorry, William Beard's book, The Artist is Monster, Cinema of David Cronenberg. Very good book. Check it out. And uh, some other ideas come from Cronenberg himself in Cronenberg on Cronenberg. This has actually been uh, updated and renewed since, uh, oh, I don't know which year, but uh, there's a new version that they seem to bring it out every couple of years to keep uh, on the up and up with the new uh, stuff in Cronenberg's uh, film career. And uh, another one to a lesser extent is The Modern Fantastic, uh, which is edited by Michael Grant. And uh, it's just a series of uh, anthology articles. And I should mention that this is uh, edited by Chris Rodley. And uh, he's done Lynch on Lynch as well, which I uh, highly recommend. Even though Lynch is uh, a little less articulate about his own films uh, than Cronenberg is. All right. So to begin, I think some first, uh, first of all, some historical and uh, technical detail about stereo. It uh, was released in 1969, and apparently it was shot for about 8500 bucks, which is, in 69, that's not cheap. Um, it was shot on a deserted college campus, Scarborough College in Scarborough, which is an eastern borough of Toronto. Uh, the people there fondly know Scarborough as either Scarlem or Scarberia. Um, and so there's a campus there, or there was a Scarborough College, which uh, was abandoned. Shot in 35mm black and white with no synchronized sound. Uh, it was directed, written, produced, and photographed, and edited by Cronenberg himself. And uh, as Beard points out, we can call it a feature film, but it's not really a feature film. It's more like an avant-garde film. And it's avant-garde in the sense that it focuses so much on issues of space and time and visual rhythm and how these elements relate to sound and vocal narration. And I think that it's important to point out that there's a lot of silence in the film, uh, which is like totally anti-Hollywood and totally anti-commercial. Uh, another thing that I think is important is to think about how stereo relates to the documentary, uh, and particularly documentary in the Canadian context. In case you don't know, Cronenberg is Canadian director. Um, and to think about Cronenberg uh, and stereo in the context of documentary makes a lot of sense because in 1969 there were not a whole lot of feature films coming out of Canada. The almost exclusively documentaries were coming out of the country. And Canada has a very, very, very strong documentary tradition um, that goes up until the 70s and, and beyond. But uh, almost all the films produced there that weren't shot or produced by Americans were... Uh, indigenous Canadian films were documentaries uh, and these were called scenics and uh, uh, to a large extent uh, in the early times uh, they were called scenics and these were made to attract immigrants to Canada and that's sort of where the documentary tradition is born out of uh, and it's important to see it in the history of Canadian film uh, because Canadians didn't really have the means of production that the US had which is one of the reasons why these this documentary tradition is born. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons that the Hollywood system was so successful is because the uh, people there, they owned the means of production and they owned distribution and they owned the exhibition of the films. Uh, and in those early years, Canadians didn't own any of this stuff. They bought their cameras from the U.S. They bought their films from the U.S. to a certain extent uh, from Europe as well, but mostly from the U.S., and more often than not, the Canadians had the films shipped to the U.S. to be developed, um, and usually to specifically to Hollywood. And so films would, uh, since they were already there, they'd be edited in the U.S. and they'd be distributed from the U.S. 
don't want to get into the whole story of the history of Canadian film, but it, I think it's important to Cronenberg. Uh, and uh, Canada has a very, very complicated relationship to the uh, production and distribution and exhibition structures in the U.S. And, you know, even the movie theaters in Canada today tend to be owned by American companies, and that was true historically as well. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, when a Canadian film is made, it's rarely shown across this country. It might be shown in Toronto or Montreal, maybe Vancouver, and uh, and only in these places because uh, it's a larger, there are larger cultural centers, and they have a, a big enough market for uh, these kinds of uh, independent cinemas to exist that can can thrive off this. So uh, getting back to the point here is that this is the sort of atmosphere in which Cronenberg is making his movies even from the beginning of his career. Now Stereo is a, a narrative film ultimately even though it has this documentary feel to it. It takes place in the Canadian Academy of Erotic Inquiry. Uh, and this is very interesting because the film is set deliberately in Canada and Canada is named. This won't always be the case in Cronenberg's career. A lot of the uh, films he does takes pl take place in nameless cities. And uh, sometimes they seem like they're set in America. But because they're shot in Canada uh, almost exclusively, it's like a st in Toronto, it's like a strange looking version of America. Um, but here, the fact of this film is that it's actually taking place in Canada, Canada in the not so far away future. And part of this, I think, is uh, there's a deliberate attempt to separate what is made in Canada from what's made in the US and that avant-garde uh, aspect as well, anti-Hollywood, anti-commercial. Now, the film is ostensibly about telepathy and some cruel experiments designed to enhance this skill for instance, certain brain parts uh, are removed and the vocal cords are removed from these people. Um, and this leaves them really with no choice but to communicate tel tel telepathically. It's as if these procedures force uh, this uh, evolution, as it were. Um, and we learn about this partly through images, but mostly we learn about it through voiceover. And this voiceover is just absolutely drenched in wonderfully artificial scientific language. There's like a comedy element to it. It's totally over the top. And again, there's this documentary style, so there's maybe a little bit of a parody or reference to documentary. Now, this voice uh, is referring to a guy named Dr. Luther Stringfellow, and I think it's interesting to note that Cronenberg has himself said that he is this sort of absentee, absentee scientist, Dr. Uh, Stringfellow. Um, and the idea is, is that if Stringfellow is the scientist who has set up these telepathy experiments in the story, then Cronenberg is really the scientist who has set up the film, which is itself a kind of experiment. And, you know, Cronenberg, in, in the book Cronenberg on Cronenberg, he stretches this metaphor to life. He says, you know, we're all kind of like mad scientists and life is our laboratory. So um, I'm going to carry on with this in the next video. So I uh, hope to see you there on scriptcastle.com.